Welcome to the HR LD podcast, where we explore cutting edge HR trends and best practices with top leaders who are shaping the future of work. Hello, and welcome back to the HR LD podcast. My name is Nick Day. I'm CEO at JGA Recruitment Group, and we are specialist HR tech and payroll recruiters. And today I am joined by Drew Simmons, who's director of UKG Pro Consulting Services at HR Tech. Now, for those not familiar, Drew brings over 25 years of experience in the field of human capital management, including five years of experience working with UKG Pro, a piece of software that I know many of you as HR professionals will already be very familiar with. Now, in his role as director of UKJ, UKG Pro Implementation Services, Drew leads a team of highly skilled consultants to ensure high quality delivery of implementation, optimization, integration, reporting, and <sighs> ongoing supporting consulting services to HR to text clients in utilizing the UKG Pro Suite. But in addition to that, Drew also holds six UKG certifications and is also certified as an ICIMS talent cloud as well. Now, his well-rounded experience is not just in the world of HCM capital management and systems. He's also skilled in recruiting, in benefits, in compensation, diversity and inclusion, and actually the whole suite of HR management services. And he's gained that experience within a multitude of industries, which gives him a fantastic track record of accomplishment in project management, system implementation, conflict resolution, and more, which makes him a fantastic guest for today's show. I should also add that not only does he have a strong focus on customer success and satisfaction, but he also has a deep awareness of the practice business model and sales process involved when it comes to helping clients and supporting colleagues with system implementation projects. And it's not just all about systems here in HCM. Drew has passions outside of the world of HR as well. He loves traveling, spending time with his family, and he works passionately as a resident DJ at the Roots of House on House <laughs> FM. In fact, I believe he has a radio show playing this very moment as we record this <laughs> podcast. So without further ado, Drew Simmons, welcome to the HR LND podcast. How are you feeling today? Thank you, Nick. I feel great. And thank you for the awesome introduction. I really appreciate it. Glad to be here today. My pleasure. I'm in a, I'm in very skilled and experienced company, particularly when it comes to UKG software. We're going to get into all of that world in just a moment. Before we do, though, my first question, something I ask all of my guests, which is this. What do the words human resources mean to you? Wow. Um, it's a great question. There's a lot there. Um, human resources to me, what does it mean? Um Basically, how do we help our people, empower our people at our respective organizations to be successful? Um, we understand that we have lots to do within the organization, a lots of initiatives and things to accomplish. But if our people are not well, we're not going to be able to achieve our goals. So I think human resources, to me, what it means is empowering your teams to be successful, giving them information and the tools and resources that they need to be successful and helping them in any way that we can. What a fantastic start to the show. Couldn't agree more. And I think that kind of showcases your uh your skills and knowledge in this sector, right? What a fantastic answer. Well, let's let's jump into the world of HCM technology. Perhaps before we jump into what you guys do as a business to begin with. Tell us about your journey into that world. What is your experience? How did you how did you get involved? Sure. So I actually found the world of human resources through uh, a high school internship program. So I had the opportunity to legitimately cut class in the 11th grade. Wow. And the purpose for that, all I heard was we get to skip a period and I was all in. Um, and so I went to this presentation um, in New York City, which is where I grew up. Um, there was a program called the Executive Internship Program, and they were a affording high school students the opportunity to work in the business world for the first half of their last year in secondary or high school. And so I went ahead and did the program and, and scored an opportunity to work for Lehman Brothers in their HR department at the age of 16 years old. And at that time, I knew that it would lead to great potential in terms of me discovering my place in the world, because I knew I wanted to to work in corporate. I just didn't know what I wanted to do. And after being there, what I did specifically in the HR department was I helped to place temps. We had an in-house temp program at this time. And I was also responsible for billing. So making sure all of the invoices were keyed into our system at the time. And this is the early 90s. So very early advent of technology there. 
I don't even think we had internet at the time, so I'm probably <laughs> dating myself. Uh, <laughs> um, and after being on the job for a week, I realized that that was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Um, and 27 years later, actually, no, 31 years later, I'm still in it. So after that internship ended, I graduated high school, went on to college and then graduate school and got both of my degrees in human resource management, and organizational behavior. And I've been in the field of HR for the last 27 years, and I absolutely love it. Primarily, um, I've primarily been on the technology side of the business. But as you've said in the intro, I've been in all different areas. Of, of HR and I love them all, but technology is my first love. Well, huge kudos to you. It sounds like you've even done a bit of the work that I do if you started in the temp side of yeah. things, recruiting and onboarding. And I mentioned recruiting mm -hmm. introduction. So yeah, fantastic. What a what a great, what a great journey you've had. Well, if we think about the, the world of human capital management, um from my perspective, certainly as a recruiter in this space, right, it is constantly changing. It's moving yes. really, really fast. And I'm seeing organizations really fight to attract and retain top talent. Obviously, that's why we come in as a recruitment firm. But it means that HCM vendors in response are rapidly innovating. They're trying to meet the needs of what is a changing environment, a changing business landscape. And it means that there's a huge amount of choices out there now, more than I've ever seen before, sort of mm -hmm. coming, coming into the market, offering solutions for everything and everything within the world of HR management. So tell us a little bit about HR Architect and in particular kind of solutions and services that you guys provide and why it can be so helpful to have an expert such as yourself on side with the client. Sure. So with the introduction of human capital management technology, there are lots of decisions that have to be made. So obviously the most important thing is what is it that we need as a client potentially that helps to empower our business? And there are so many options out there. And so there are so many different ways that you can go. So you have to be very strategic in making those decisions. And then once you decide on the system that you want, you've got to decide how should it be configured? Why do we need certain features? What are our pain points within the organization? So it's a lot to unpack, not only just in the selection process, but also in the course of implementation. So what H Architect does is we do a, a number of things. We can help you with the selection of your system. So if you decide, okay, these are the key factors that we need, or you need help deciding what those key factors are, we can come in and assist you with that initiative. Then once you decide on the system that has to be um, implemented, then what we do is we actually implement on, on behalf of our vendors that we work with. So we're basically acting as an extension of the vendor, and we have a project manager assigned to the project, as well as a system consultant that engages in analysis discussions to find out what your requirements are, and then also engage in configuring the system. And then we also um, administer the testing process and then go forward through deployment. Sometimes as part of that process, clients may be, again, confused about what it is that you know, they're being asked to provide. So if you're asked to provide a list of location codes that have to adhere to a certain format and you have no clue how that's going to be done, we also engage in what's called client-side support. So we can we can help you understand how the system can best be used to meet your requirements and then help you understand how the data should be set up to be provided. And it helps to move the project along a lot much much more smoothly. So we do a number of things. We also do training as well. So when clients are on a system, we come in and we provide uh, additional knowledge on top of the vendor training to help them understand a little bit more in depth about how the technology can work to empower their business. And so we really help to empower our clients to be self-sufficient once they go live on the product. So we do a number of things within the HCM space. We've been around since 1997. So we've been in the business for 26 years um, and we have clients all around the world. We, we are based in the United States and Canada, but we have clients all around the world. Perfect, perfect. And part of your service as well is you also help pair companies with experts. So you can mm -hmm. work along systems and along with systems teams and businesses to help build roadmaps for HCM technology and really make sure that they get the best out of their tech. And I think that's a common problem I'm seeing with HR professionals that we liaise with. They build all these suites or they bring in these suites of tech and they don't know how to get the best out of it. And then they don't really know where to start. And you use the word confusing. A lot of people get confused about what it is they need or where to start. What are the, mm -hmm. the key stages or key things we need to consider for well, the two things, really? The first is to get the best out of our solution. But Amy, mm -hmm. before that phase, 
to even go about a successful implementation? What are those, some of those key steps? What I'd like to ask you, Drew, if I can, is what are some of the key steps someone listening to this who maybe is thinking about a new system change? What are the things they should be thinking about? What are the, the really important stages that they need to consider to ensure that they really do make a successful project when it comes to HCM implementation? Well, the most important thing is what is it that you're trying to achieve? What is the business challenge that you have that you need to uh, address? Right. And so as you go through that exploration, make sure you ask the right people within your organization. Um, all too often, we see executives who will make those decisions, and they may not incorporate their subject matter experts in that process. So I think that requires a great deal of exploration internally to understand what it is that we need to accomplish. And then once you decide on that, then you start to work on finding the appropriate resources for the deployment or the implementation. So as you do that, you need to be real realistic about bandwidth. A, a lot of times we see people that set up these projects and they write them down or they may not write them down. And this one name keeps coming up. Yeah, this person's responsible for payroll. This person's <laughs> responsible for HR. This person's responsible for X, Y, and Z. So that is a problem because what you're doing is you're setting that person up to be the single point of failure, right? right. So you want to make sure you're realistic about everybody's capabilities. Not everybody can be all in one place, all places at the same time. So you want to make sure that you involve them, but you don't put too much on them. That makes sense. I think one of the fears that HR people have is they want to bring in a new piece of software, which in the long term is going to improve. You will hope it will improve you know, the efficiency of what we're trying to deliver, but actually you go, I just don't have the time to do yeah. this on top of everything else. I'm already <clears> spinning <throat> 25 plates and adding that on top is one thing too much. So tell me a little bit about the role that you do. What's the role that you play in your organization and how can you help support those individuals that do want to take that step, but actually feel like they don't have the bandwidth, as you put it, uh, to, to, to go forward? Sure. So as the director of the UKG Pro Consulting Services Practice, um, I provide oversight on our projects. So as clients navigate through their journey during their implementations on their respective systems, I just make sure that everything is running smoothly on those projects, that they're getting adequate support from the consulting team. So I'm responsible for a team of approximately 40 consultants. And part of my job is also to empower them with tools to be successful. So it's critical for us to understand the implementation methodology of the various vendors that we support. So I make sure that everybody understands it. We have weekly huddles so that we can understand and discuss what is required and provide a space for those consultants to be successful. So if they have questions about anything or there's a dilemma that they have, have where the client has a requirement, but the system, we're not sure if the, if the system is capable of handling it. We get together, we discuss it as a team because we end up brainstorming and coming up with solutions. So my job is to provide an environment where we're fostering those kinds of communications, not only amongst the team, but also with the vendors that we support. Okay, super. So let's assume that if I'm listening to this, we think, okay, I, I want to go forward. I've established the why. I understand what I'm trying to achieve. I've, I've mm -hmm. worked with C-suite. I've got their buy-in. I now understand that perhaps I've paired with a partner like HR Tech or like yourself, Drew, and I've got some resource here that's going to help me on my journey. Mm -hmm. What comes next in that implementation? What's the next thing we need to be considering? So the next thing we need to consider would be um, planning. So you get with the vendor and they're going to issue you a project plan, right? Over Well, first of all, they're going to ask you who was involved in the project. And so that list that I referred to earlier, you would present them with that list so that we know who your, who your client side project manager is, who is your subject matter expert for payroll and for talent, et cetera. And then once that's been provided, then they're going to provide you with a project plan with all the different milestones of the project. And so typically they will provide you with the milestones that they are responsible for, but there are things that as a client, you will be solely responsible for. So you wanna make sure that that's incorporated into the master plan. So an example would be on the UKG side as part of the methodology, um, when it comes to the implementation and rollout of security roles, that is something that the client is responsible for. Yeah. When it comes to things like business process workflow, so we put in a transaction for a change of salary. Okay, so th what's the approval path for that? Is there a special approval path if the increase is over 5%, that kind of thing? The client is responsible for that as well. When it comes to things like custom reporting, 
So, and a lot of times people think that the vendor is going to be responsible for these things, but they're shell-shocked when they review the contract or because they didn't review the contract. And then we come in as an implementation team and tell them they're responsible for these things. They're completely surprised. So mm -hmm. just being prepared for those decision points is extremely critical to ensure that you're going to be successful in your deployment. And again, if you don't have any clue as to what you should do in those areas that you are responsible for, then you can call a company like HR Architect to come in and help you make those decisions and see you through it. Yeah, nice. And I think sometimes we're, we we don't make decisions, even in you know, doesn't matter what level you are, even in C-suite, if we're fearful or we don't understand something, right? So we're yeah. fearful of what we don't understand. Now, what you, there's some terms coming out there that you know you might be the best HR operational director the world has ever seen, right? But it doesn't mean you're an expert in everything to do with systems implementation. And there are mm -hmm. terms there you've mentioned today, including building software, configuration, testing, parallel running, deployment, mm -hmm. all these kind of things. We don't want those terms, though, to be the reason why we don't go ahead and make a change if we know that we can improve and automate some of our processes. So what mm -hmm. are some of the steps someone could take to overcome those those fears, that lack of understanding to make sure that I want to go ahead, I want a new system, but I don't understand everything here. Mm -hmm. what, what do I need to do to, to, to overcome that, 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 that lack of knowledge, I guess, for want of a better word? Well, I'm so glad you asked that question. It's an excellent question. I think the most important thing is don't be afraid to be transparent. So if you're not right. sure, as human beings, we don't know everything. There's no way that we can know everything. And there might be times where you may feel as though you're expected to know something and you just don't. And I think the key to be successful here is to go ahead and just say, wait, hold on. What exactly is that? What does that mean? Um, within our industry, we have a lot. That we use acronyms a lot. And a lot of times people assume that everybody on the call, if we're on a conference call, knows what those acronyms are. And I always make a point to say, wait, hold on. I'm not sure I know what that means. Could someone explain that to me? Because you're about to make a very critical decision based on partial information. And so that will lead potentially to a disastrous deployment. And ultimately, the key thing is making sure that our people are getting paid properly. And I don't want that to not happen because I don't understand something. And so I think it's important that people are transparent about their knowledge. And just be candid. If you don't know exactly what something means, go ahead and ask and just explore, do some research and pull in the, 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 the experts who can help you understand what those things mean. You know what, Adri, you're so right. It, it brought a memory back to me. This was several years ago. I remember um, we were going through a, a project. It wasn't to do with systems implementation, I have to add. But um, in, in, at the end of the briefing, I was like, well, let's make sure all, our, all of our plans are smart. We'll all do smart plans and then we can work on <laughs> And the comment came back and said, surely all plans are smart. And I said, oh, well, they are, but they had never heard of the action, didn't know the what smart. it meant. So mm -hmm. they just thought that I was adding the word smart because planning is a smart thing to do. And right. had they not made that comment, I my mistake made the assumption that everyone knew what a smart plan was. Mm -hmm. As opposed to the individual that just came back and went, surely planning is just a smart thing to do. <laughs> so I mean, it was a great example. Like, acronyms can be used and sometimes people are fearful of questioning them for, for want of or not looking like we don't understand, right? But that's mm -hmm. the way to success is, is through that. And I know that you guys are really, really big on training. It's a massive part of what you do. It's not just the implementation piece. It's making sure that everyone involved in a project is fully trained and up to speed. Tell me a little bit more about some of the training uh, provisions you put in place to help ensure a successful HCM implementation occurs. Absolutely. So in many of our deployments, our vendors have a curriculum of training that they expect the clients to go through. So it's almost like a, a college or university curriculum because there are courses that actually have course numbers and that kind of thing. So they're expected to go through that training as a base level. Um, beyond that, what we do is we ensure, our project managers ensure that that training is being taken, and there are certain steps by which that has to be taken. So as an example, there might be courses that you have to take before um, parallel testing begins on a payroll implementation. You have to make sure that you take that training, because if you don't, and we go into testing, you're expected to open up the payroll as a client. And if you can't do it, there are going to be problems. So we basically track to make sure that that training is being taken. In addition to that, 
um, like on the UKG side, as an example, we do training on top of what UKG provides. So the, specifically, there is a business intelligence or reporting course or a series of courses that they teach at UKG. But what we do on top of that is say, OK, so now that you've taken the training that shows you how to create a report, now we want to show you what does this data mean that's in the system? What are the data packages that you use to get certain aspects or certain reports that ne you need to tell the story with your business. So those are the kind of trainings that we do. We also get, we engage in change management. So helping clients to understand, okay, what is the rollout plan in terms of communication? How do you inform your employees, your managers, your administrators that your system is changing? What is the timeline by which you do that? And a part of that is understanding the culture so that we can provide a campaign that works best for your business. Nice, nice. So I I'm making an assumption here that everyone listening is potentially either embarking on or has been through some kind of implementation. Mm -hmm. Certainly as a recruiter, I've never seen so much transformation take place in the last 12 months in, in their history. I've been doing this for 20 years. It has gone crazy with how many departments and businesses now are either transforming their payroll uh, systems or their HR systems. But that is, is, is wrong for me to make an assumption that everyone's doing it. Yeah. And there will be some people, A, resistant to change. They say, you know, why do we need to change our system? Right? We've got a system that, that pays people on time, mm -hmm. that manages our HR process. We don't need to change anything. You know, why do we need to invest this money? So what are some of the considerations that people need to think about if they are potentially either considering or maybe they've never considered a change? But why mm -hmm. now do you think could be the time that they maybe challenged it, even if it is working? What are the things they may not have considered that actually if they did were to make a change, it might just open up a whole world of options for them? So considering that it's 2023 um, now and we have lot access to so much technology that does so much for us. Yeah. If you're doing processes that the same processes that you've been doing in 2005, it's probably time for you to think about doing something different. So if I had to encapsulate everything you just asked me into one area, um, what I see is automation would be a big um, area of potential change for an organization. So if you have a series of emails that you send out as a result of an HR transaction and you're sending them manually, it's probably time for you to think about revisiting your process and asking your vendor right now, is this something you can do? How do we set it up? And if it can't be done, then it might be time for you to look for another system or to come to a company like H Architect to decide to help you decide, okay, how can we roll this out? Because nine times out of 10, you already have the functionality available in your system. You just don't know how to use it. So um, some examples could be new hire notifications. So as soon as someone comes into the organization, the system, someone po uh, populates that data into the system, or there's an integration that brings that data into your system, and there should be a notification that automatically pops out and says, okay, Drew Simmons started within the organization, and it could sweep the system every day, every week, and then automatically send those notifications. So that's an area that we see a lot where people have these legacy spreadsheets outside the system, or they they're doing what I call the bad, the bad word, the V word, the V look up in Excel, right? Yeah. So if they're doing those kinds of things, it's probably time for you to revisit your process. And we also do process re-engineering. We can help you with that. And in terms of, you know, what it is you're doing in your current system, um, we do assessments. So we go through, if you think about when you go to the mechanic and you hear like a knocking noise and you go to your mechanic and you say, I think there's an issue with the wheels, but the mechanic says, no, it doesn't sound like it's the wheels. It could be something else. So let us go ahead and do a diagnostic test. We do the same equivalent within our industry. So we do system assessments where we go look at everything in your system to make sure it's working the way it should and give you some things to think about in terms of some of the functionality that you're not using. And then we help you to fix those things. Nice, nice. Yeah, it's a nice way of putting it. So what is, what's some of the um, return on investment that a client might look to, to, to discover post-implementation? If, if you've gone and you've done the diagnostic, you've realized that actually you've got a system here that either you're not fully utilizing, I've had that mm -hmm. in my own recruitment software, where we've had software in the past where we probably only used 10% of the entire capability of the software. And ultimately we didn't mm -hmm. need what we didn't need and we changed. So what is what some of the return on investment things that you've discovered or that you regularly see with the clients you've worked with post-implementation? Excellent question. So I think 
um, what we see is that people are freed up to do a lot more. So if we find that, you know, the payroll team was spending X amount of hours on a payroll process, and then once we get through working with them and they say, oh my goodness, I could see, or actually during the implementation, they say, oh my goodness, I can see how this is going to save us so much more time. And then after deployment, we start to see that they've got, you know, an extra seven hours a week. And now they can do other things and they can make empowering decisions in terms of running the business rather than managing the system because now maybe the system is doing those things automatically. That's where we see return on investment because our organizations are now able to get their people to do other things. So it just helps to make things much more efficient within the business. Yeah, that makes sense. What about the um what about the client? I'm gonna throw you a bit of a challenging curveball here, then Drew. So well, I'm a uh-huh. client, right? And everyone's unique. So let's say I don't know, I'm a I'm trying to think of a most random car. I, I have an underwater basket weaving business, right? And I'm based in, I don't know, somewhere right out of town, nowhere near anywhere. My business is completely unique, right? This is a business you've never seen before. How do you, what's the kind of process for you guys to go about understanding my business, my objectives? Well, I, mm-hmm. kind of, I'm coming to you going, I just don't, <clears throat> anyone can understand what you do until you're kind of within it. What are the kind of the process you follow to understand my strategy that, I don't know, what, what would be that process? So I I chuckle when you ask that question because we hear that from all of our clients. I bet you've never met anybody like us before. We're extremely unique. And we're like, yeah, we've heard that before. Um, But I think that speaks to the nature of what we do. So what we do is we come in and we want to understand your business. And the way that we do that is, well, first of all, we're going to do research online. So we're going to look at the company website. We're going to look at some industry websites so that we can understand the industry. But nine times out of 10, our consultants have had exposure to your industry already. So we understand some of the nuances when it comes to setting up some of the earnings codes that we may need to set up. Um, we use the, our experience to set those those precedents. And then in terms of what's happening in your specific business, what we do is we have a series of analysis sessions during the beginning of the implementation. And so we're asking you, okay, so how do you pay your employees? What are the kinds of nuances that we need to be aware of? Um, and again, we bring in knowledge of prior clients to that conversation, because maybe there are some things that you should be doing that you don't know, and now you're gonna start doing them because we're talking about that. And that's one of the things I see a lot in projects too, is that it's important to probably front load your projects with analysis sessions and just take your time through the planning stage. Because as you do that, you can then ensure that you're going to have a smoother testing period and rollout when it comes to deployment. So if you plan properly, execution will be seamless. So we take time to sit down and talk to you about your business to learn it in addition to doing research externally too. Super. You mentioned the word time there. You mentioned actually in the the answer before as well about some of the ROIs, you know, getting rid of some of the manual tasks, allowing people to spend more time on the strategic side of the business. And yet, Mm -hmm. interestingly, um, and almost conversely, like in in a business that we're in, in HR, the biggest constraint to success that we hear Mm -hmm. is they don't have enough time to do what they want to do, or they're spending all their time focusing on talent attraction and retention is a massive problem an expensive problem it's a world that i'm immersed in it's why we exist like we know that's a real challenge out there Mm. so people want to create more time and they're fearful of making a change like going through an hcm implementation because they're worried that's another drain on their time but the reality is at the end of this process that's what everyone's geared towards achieving right is achieving Mm -hmm. more time so you can spend more time on your pre-hire process more time Mm -hmm. on your onboarding strategies, looking at what benefits are being utilized, self-service, engagement with your employees. But it's you have to kind of go through this work to get to the other side, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, I guess, that must be where a lot of the resistance, I'm making an assumption, I might be wrong, but where some of the resistance might be. So how do you handle some of that resistance to change for those that think, oh, I just, I don't know, they, I want to get there, but I can't. And what will happen to my employees if I was to make this shift? And you know, mm-hmm. the managing, managing resistance must be a big part of, of, of what you guys have to handle. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I think the key to that is just helping people to understand what their options are. So, and helping them to reflect on how things have been going up to this point. And so clearly something is not working because you're looking to make a change. We understand that time is something that is required. Um, and I and we get this a lot. During implementations, people will say, well, I've got a day job. 
So how do you manage that? That is difficult. Um, and I understand it because I was a customer before coming to HR Architect. So I think the key is to just help people understand the benefits in the long term of why we want to do this and having a realistic conversation about, okay, these this is where we are and this is how we get there. And I think helping people to understand that the, there are um, variables that may be an opportunity cost. So if we don't spend the time or if we are, let's say as an example, we're rushed through an implementation. Okay, we can do that, but then the quality is not going to be that great. So you may miss a few things on your project. And again, you're talking about people's livelihoods. You're talking about mm -hmm. making sure they're being paid properly, that they have adequate benefit coverage. And so that's not something we can afford to cut corners on. And so there have been so many times where you've had to have that frank conversation with a client that is so focused on time. It's like, OK, well, you can either put more resources on the project or you can expect um, lower quality, but we can't have all three of those things. In project management, that's a core tenant. It's quality, resources, and time. Those three things are opportunity costs of one another. So we've got to be able to to answer that and help our clients to answer those questions. Sure. And I know what, I don't care who you are, what sector you work in, outside of HR, anywhere in the business, we all seem to be wanting more of that work-life balance, right? They're yeah. To, be full on at work, work hard by all means. But at the end of the day, I have an opportunity to, 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 to park my work here and go and live my life here and, and never the two shall mix. That's the perfect thing, right? So yeah. I have to ask you the question, right? Because outside of your work as, uh, as you know, heading up all these implementations, Drew, you're a resident DJ at the Roots of House and House. <laughs> so I've got to, you know, this is a rare thing I get on the show. So tell me a little <laughs> bit about your work outside. I'm keen. Sure. So House FM is actually a house music station that is um, headquartered in London, one of my favorite cities in the world. Um, and they have had they've been on the air since uh, 2001 um, and have great house music shows. But and I've been listening since uh, the spring of 2013. And after listening for about five years, I said, OK, but you guys don't have a show that is dedicated to the genres of music that gave birth to house, primarily disco, because I'm a huge Donna Summer okay. fan. I love Gloria Gaynor, Casey and the Sunshine Band. And I also like Motown as well. And Motown gave birth to house music too. And I said, well, you guys don't have anything like that. Somebody should do the show. And so after getting to know the DJs and station management, they said, well, why don't you do it? And I said, but I'm not a DJ. I'm a consultant. I work in HR technology. And they said, no, but we know that you're dedicated. Whatever it is that you're going to do, you're going to do 120%. So I had to learn how to put together basically a podcast because it's a podcast format. We just play yeah. music. That's the only difference. I have done a couple of interviews with some big disco acts from the 70s. Um, so I had to learn microphones and audio uh, uh, software and technology and you know how to do a transition and how to play music and fade it out that's all self-taught in a matter of three months and the show aired uh february 24th of 2020 right before covid began um and that is how i got through covid so basically i had something to focus on and so three and a half years later i'm still on the air and it is an absolute joy to work on the show it's amazing well you know what? if you're as passionate as i imagine you are as passionate about hr and um tech as you are about djing then i think both hr <laughs> HR architect and and the the, the house uh, radio station will be very very lucky to have you i've got a little um thanks thing to fame i'll send it here because no one if only because you mentioned disco i didn't realize that was where you, you your passion lied within within that radio uh, broadcasting that you do but i once shared a dodgem with leo sayer um, okay yeah so that's not something that everyone does every day and my awesome. singer was once a backing singer for rose voice so there you go. Wow, Rolls Royce is amazing. So there you amazing. go. Two little That's things great. I'll put out there. A little bit of disco. <laughs> so last question before we open the HR and Vault. Um, and it's a question actually for you to come up with. It, it's such an important area that's impacting everyone in HR at the minute, and not just in the US, UK, globally, the transformation, the projects, the the, the striving to, to better efficiency, the strive to better automation, the mm -hmm. strive for better work-life balance. What's the question I haven't asked you that maybe I should have done? that you think, you know what, before we end the show, I think your listeners would be really beneficial if, if, if we just just left them with this thing to consider. Wow. That's a good one. I wasn't expecting that question. Um, it's a great question. Um, what is the one question that you have not asked me? 
Um, I think it would be if I was to work with a human capital management consulting firm, what should I be looking for? Um, and I think the way that I would answer that question is I would want someone who not only has expertise within the industry and knowing the product that is being supported, but getting to learn the employees. So what are their, what are their backgrounds? How long have they worked within the industry? So, you know, we talk about this all the time when we deploy a system and we assign a project team, you're looking potentially at a, over a hundred years combined experience between the project manager that we assign, any implementation consultant, system consultants. So understanding how how experienced they are with the within the industry and with the product. And also looking at, you know, what kind of, of accolades, like what is the industry saying about them? So when you think about like Raven Intelligence is a, is a prime example. So it's a third party site that goes through and clients provide their feedback on vendors and the services that they're providing. H Architect is the one, I think we've gotten 130 uh, reviews to date and it's actually the most within the industry. And we're averaging at about 4.9 out of five stars. So looking to see like how well are they're doing. With UKG, we've gotten partner of the year four times out of the last six years. So you wanna align yourself with a vendor that is extremely um, successful and knowledgeable within the industry. And not only that, but the clients are saying that and seeing it as well. Yeah, it's a great point. You know what? I'll put a link to that uh, to that site in the show notes as well for those who want to check out the review site. It's a bit like Glassdoor, right? But for HR right. vendors. So Correct. it's really, really useful. Um, and actually, we don't buy anything these days without doing a review. You know, I go on Amazon and want to buy something. I review, you know, always check the reviews first. And it's, That's it's, right. Uh, it's the real feedback we're looking for to really you know, the, the user experience that really matters. I think to sum up some of the things we talked about today then and, and bringing that last point into play, which I'm really glad to ask the question, start with knowing, if you're going to have a really successful implementation, we need to start with knowing our why and get mm -hmm. the stakeholder buy-in to do that. We need to make sure that we're planning those processes correctly. We've got a really good roadmap so that we understand what we're going to follow and obviously engage with a partner like HR to tech or someone similar who can help us along with that, with that phased implementation process. And with a, with a deployment of resources that you guys can provide, mm -hmm. making sure that it's not all falling on the, on the hands of an HR professional who's got a lot of other <laughs> plates spinning as it is. Um, I think also looking to, uh, as you mentioned earlier, to automate as much as people possibly can and look at where mm -hmm. the efficiency savings can be, where the ROI exists. But as you said at the end as well, it's, it's also about training, Learning mm -hmm. and development, making sure that you, at the end of the project, people understand how to get the best out of that software. But as you said, right at the end of that last answer is also putting the employees front and center. You know, why are we doing this? How is it going to benefit our employees? We've got to make sure things working smoothly. Uh, and if you've got all those things right and you've researched your vendor, then most people should be able to come out with a really successful project. Um, so for those hopefully listening to this that are thinking about it, I think you've given us a fantastic blueprint today, Drew, of how someone can achieve a successful implementation. So thank you ever so much for helping us with that. Um, I'm going to open the HR l and Vault. Three short, sharp questions for you. Um, if okay. you could give one piece of advice to the world, what would it be? Oh, wow. Um, one piece of advice to the world. Uh, living your truth. Living yeah, your nice. truth and being being transparent and candid um, being able to say no, you know, there are times where we can't do everything and something's got to give and not being afraid to say no. And I think part of that is, is living in your truth. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. I love the, uh, there's a coaching saying as well, people to, to reverse it. Every time you say yes to something, what are you saying no to? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. I Absolutely. I couldn't agree with that more. The second question, if you had the opportunity, what advice would you give to a younger you just starting out in this new world of work? <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think the advice that I would give to my younger you would be don't be so afraid to have fun. So I, I literally graduated college on a Friday and started working on Monday. And I've been working consistently like that for the last 
27 years. Um, but I think I could have taken more time to have fun, you know, go to a few more parties yeah. um, and that kind of thing. I mean, I did do some partying when I was younger. Um, actually did a lot of partying, but I could have done a little bit more. So <laughs> and taking time, taking time to smell the roses, you know, go on some vacations a little bit earlier. I Like you said, I love to travel, but that didn't begin until fairly recently um, because I just didn't take the time. I was working so hard. And I think, you know, as the younger me, I probably should have taken a little bit more me time. Yeah, nice. You know, it's 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 a great response. And um, someone once said to me, I don't know if, you, if you're into Formula One racing, but I think it's probably the same in any kind of uh, mm -hmm. racing, right? But in the, in the world of F1, um, the, the races are won and lost in the, in the pits. It's the time mm. the car recovers when they change the tires. And if they don't do that, the car doesn't make it to the finish line. That's right. right. And right. taking those vacations, taking that time out for ourselves to just rebalance and recheck and re reinvigorate ourselves and just take a moment, so important. And we give yeah. our best version of ourselves once we have the opportunity to recover. So I think it's really valuable advice. And I'm really glad. Yeah, I, I really wish I had learned that much earlier than I did. Yeah, yeah you and me both. Uh, last <laughs> question. What is the guiding principle or behavior you see in every great leader that you work with? Um, being empathetic, you have to be able to understand your people and feel, feel their situations, feel what they're feeling and providing support and being there for them and, and being authentic, you know, without authenticity, you can't be an effective leader. I think it's also important to be a servant leader. There isn't anything I would ask my team to do that I'm not going to do myself. And so I think those traits make for a very powerful, engaging leader. Yeah, couldn't agree more. That's that mic drop. You learned these uh, mics now, Adi. You can drop your mic at that point. Perfect. Absolutely fantastic response. Well, look, for those who want to learn out more, um, I will put a link, of course, to HR Architect Services in the show notes. There'll be a, a link in there as well for anyone that may want to request a consultation uh, with Drew. Uh, I'll put a LinkedIn profile there so you can reach out direct. And I will put a link to the uh, the Raven site you mentioned, which is like the glass door for HR vendors. So people are interested in looking at tech and want to look at some of the reviews. As you say, 4.9 average, over 130 plus reviews you know you're doing something right but i'll put a link in there for those that want to do their independent research uh, from independent verified reviews you can go to that site to look at that as well so all of those links will be in the show notes uh, for those who want to find out more and of course if you are an hr professional listening to this uh, show perhaps you need a project manager on the client side to work with a great consultancy firm like hr architect then we are an agency that can help you that's what we do so please reach out to either myself or any of my wonderful team at jj recruitment and we'll be well we'll be privileged to, to and, and very very uh, open to helping and supporting you the best that we can you can get us at jgarecruitmentinc.com if you're in the us or jgarecruitment.com in the uk uh, just leaves me to say one final thank you to drew simmons for joining me today on the hr lnd podcast um, you've been fantastic at giving us a whistle stop tour into what it takes to to deliver a successful implementation project and and what we need to consider when working with an hr vendor like yourself so thank you ever so much for joining me today thank you nick it's been great <laughs>